ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and Alex Farley. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, my friend. I just, I, I, I did that one off the cuff here, you know. Um, we, we, we are, uh, we are live right now for a, an event um, that we're, we're doing here with our good friends at Lifecycle Insights. And we got Alex Farling here. So Alex, thank you for, uh, for being here. I'm in uh, New Jersey um, on the Hudson River. Well, on the, on the banks of the Hudson River. I'm actually on the Hudson River um, <laughs> from New York City skyline. And so why don't you uh, tell everybody why you got thrown off a plane last night? Oh, exactly. oh, oh, it was different than that. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's a different story, but okay. uh, it's it's been wild and crazy. Uh, as uh, Ida came roaring into uh, the area last night, um, what was most amazing is when we were looking across the Hudson, and the New York skyline was gone. It was it was gone. It was a blackout. And um, uh, one of the guys from the hotel here came out. and He says this never happens. Um, because we, we weren't sure if at first it was just the rain coming down or if it truly was, um, you know, uh, an outage, electrical outage. But uh, pretty scary stuff. Uh, really sad. There's uh, what I last heard about 20 people have lost their lives um, in the Northeast from it. So um, lots of MSPs from um, the Build It conference are stranded here right now. So um, but anyways, we are here for some uh, for for some fun learning. Um, we have got uh, some great content today that we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about differentiating your MSP, which is uh, a, a critical aspect of what needs to be done. Um, that will include building a budget report that you can take to the bank. And we all want to go to the bank, right? Because yeah, uh, that's it's one special. of my favorite places to go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I go there, ask for free samples, but they don't find it funny anymore. You know, they're just like, you know, dad joke and stuff. So the 20th time was the charm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, um, Alex, you yeah. know, you, you know, you do a number of webinars, um, throughout the channel. Yeah, and, I like to uh, talk and people let me talk. I don't, I don't understand it, but Hey, if they, if they don't, um, you know, get to a point where they say, Alex, all right, we've heard enough of you, then that's right. a good thing. Right. Yeah. Right. So what, um, you know, in, in talking about today's topic, what, uh, what, what's so a driving force for you to want to help educate MSPs with this area? Well, you know, I think sales is someplace where MSPs struggle um, and, and they really struggle in the fact that we should be selling to our clients all the way through the, the life cycle of, of owning them as clients. Um, and, and it's just someplace that's, that MSPs traditionally struggle, which kind of is a pet peeve of mine because MSPs are so good at process. And I'm right. a firm believer that sales is just another process that if they step back and dumped all their head trash and tore it apart like a process, they would do a phenomenal job. Of, right. of picking apart the sales process and building it into something they could really not to be not to play with the puns from the name of the webinar, but they, something they could really take to the bank. Um, right. Sales is just another problem to be solved. And if we treated it just like we do the regular life cycle of, you know, identify, detect, protect, or protect, detect, respond, recover. And if we just treated it like this, this um, forever improving process, um, we would do a whole lot better at it as an industry. So I'm going to stand up on my soapbox and I'm going to talk about differentiating yourself, about standing out, about having a sales process that works until people start doing it and don't need to hear it anymore. Yeah. That's yeah, I mean, really uh, what it boils down to. I tell you, just uh, being here at the conference uh, the last few days, talking to other MSPs, um, you know, that is the number one area that uh, number one area that they need help in and the number one area that there is uh, a, a lot of fear. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's that fear of the unknown. I mean, we, we all got into this business because, um, you know, we, we love what we do in this area. And, um, and we had this level of confidence of getting into it and just driving forward. And we just need to change our mindset. And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, all the, all, the, all the good coaches call it what it is. They call it head trash. And that's really what it is. And we've got we've to figure out how to set some of that aside. So today we'll take a, a singular perspective on how do you take this to your existing customers and how to use a budget um, to, to really drive more purchases from our customers, less resistance to upgrading hardware, lifecycle management, all these kind of things. Because right now, lifecycle management is more important than it's ever been. Um, right. Was it just yesterday? People were talking about uh, into November and December already when they're expecting to get orders that they're placing today. Yeah, absolutely. 
<clears throat> so planning this stuff ahead of time, ordering it early, budgeting for the for the renewals and replacements is going to become more and more important as we fight our way through this chip shortage. Whether you believe it's here for six or nine months or whether you believe it's going to be here for two or three years, either way, we've got to address it. And we'd, yep. do in our, we'd be doing our customers a disservice if we didn't at least prepare for the possibility that it could be here for a while. Got it. So to that end, I do want to talk just a little bit about differentiation. And, um, you know, there there was a time when you could differentiate yourself as an MSP because everybody else was a, was a break-fix shop. And in my mind, uh, it was in 2008 when in sleepy little Delaware, and I know everything gets there late. So in 2008, a lot of the folks listening were probably already MSPs, but we were the first MSP in our county. And I bought thirty or $45,000 worth of lab tech licenses at the time. ConnectWise didn't even own them yet. Um, hmm. A, a $10,000 server to, to run it on, um, you know, put all this investment into building this managed services business. And today, anybody with a credit card can be an MSP, right? right so right. credit card, give you my, my, my uh, business uh, or my social security number or my EIN, and now I'm an MSP. So, you know, it's, it's, just, it's getting harder to differentiate. It was cool when we could go out and talk about, hey, we can do automated patches while you sleep at night. Now, nobody cares about that because everybody does it. It's table stuff. Right. Um, so everybody can claim, I hire the best techs. I, I, I deploy the best solutions. I only work with the best vendors. We answer your tickets the fastest and have the shortest SLAs. Like you can try and use all of those things as SLAs or as, as differentiators, but they just make you sound like every other salesperson. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a whole conversation to be had around what it looks like to differentiate your MSP. And that really drives to this slide, because if you've been to a ConnectWise show or to a Datto show, you've probably seen a guy running around in a chicken costume. Well, that's not the only way Connect Booster differentiated themselves. They were the first company to come to the MSP space and say, get paid for your stuff before you do it. And stop having to chase your own money because it's your money. And that was a powerful pitch. And Absolutely. it's like Chartech when they came to the table and said, stand out from the herd, right? And they give you this multicolored zebra and it's a cool logo. Yeah. But what did, what did they really mean? They meant, let's introduce you to this thing called hardware as a service. And let's go pay for Haas in the first nine months that we, that we have the equipment out there. And then you make insane amounts of money on the equipment over and over and over as you provide hardware as a service to your customers. And that was their differentiator. That's what helped them stand out. It's more than a cool logo. And I've, I work with a lot of MSPs that have really cool logos. Looking at you, Firefly MSP, they have one of the coolest logos I've seen. Um, yeah. It just Because it stands out. I almost put it on the slide. Yeah. But instead, I was like, who do I know that has a cool logo, right? Because I know this guy that stands out. He's got a good haircut. Like, he's, <laughs> he's got some glasses. But other than that, he's a good looking dude that stands out, right? <laughs> Everybody's got to have something that really helps yeah. them stand out. And I think that's getting harder today in the MSP space. I don't know what you think. But I feel like it is. It tough. is. And, uh, it, you know, and I think one of the things that um, we do is we overlook, um, you know, where we do stand out. We overlook at, you know, the things that are so unique to what we offer. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and if you feel that everybody listening, write this down. Blue Ocean Strategy, one of the best books you can read that talks about. Uh, helping you identify the things that set you apart from the herd to steal from Chartech. Um, and, you know, one of the best ways that you can really um, take a, pick apart your own business model and identify the things that, that, are, that are your differentiators. But another thing that everybody's doing today is leading with cybersecurity, right? Because we've been told risk is what sells. Um, so we're at, a, at, a, at an on-site meet, on-site event last week in front of 60 or 70 MSPs. And one of the, one of the presenters said, customers buy risk but they stay for the strategy. And that's really, that was really imp impressive to me. They buy on the risk. They buy because you convince them that there's a boogeyman out there in North Korea, China, um, you know, some guy in, in his mom's basement, um, malware, whatever. They buy because they think they're exposed to downtime, business interruption, some sort of risk but they stay because of strategy. If you just solve for that risk and then everything just plugs along and you don't do anything to take it to the next level, they're going to take a meeting with the next guy who knocks on the door and says, yeah, but I can do all of that for $5 cheaper. Yeah, because our, our world is, is progressively changing every single day. And yeah. um, you may have something that you feel is your differentiating factor, um, but that can get blown away real quickly. And yeah, if you're yeah. complacent- you By, know, by the next guy with a credit card, right? Because right. we can all buy a exactly. sliver of the same product or service. So low barrier to entry is our, our 
you know, biggest optical. Little obstacle. to no barrier to entry. In fact, that group yeah. that, uh, that Carl Palachuk's putting together to talk about um, MSP setting standards and things, they're talking about what should the barrier to entry be. And I don't know that right. anybody has a good answer, but people in the industry are actually talking about, uh, you know, why we need a barrier to entry to, to, to deliver better on the MSP model and differentiate those who have done things right from those who haven't. Um, but I think one place that we really can differentiate is by really delivering strategic long-term advice. And we recommend a strategic long-term budget. And I don't think that the power of that can be overstated. Um, our clients hate surprises. Yeah. I remember walking into one of my customers and going, Windows XP is going to be dead next year. Um, I probably should have told you this earlier, but I need you to replace 14 machines at about 1200 bucks a piece. And yeah. there were some unkind words said. Um, he was still a customer when I sold my MSP and I liked the guy, but he was mad at me. No two ways about it, right? I had screwed up. Um, our clients hate surprises. We sell managed services specifically as a sales pitch to avoid surprises, right? right. That's, one, that's one of the things. That's one of the things we pitch. If you have a problem, it's on me, not on you. If it takes me 10 hours to fix it. If you, have, if you have downtime, I'll deploy three people and we'll get out there and we'll figure out what's wrong and we'll get the problem fixed and we'll get you back up and running. Those financial burdens are now on me and you just pay me a flat low price so that, I, so that you know what you're spending to get uh, reliable service. And so when budgetary surprises come up because we didn't tell the customer that, hey, 2024, you're going to have a lot of, of technology expense, we should probably talk about it now. If we don't do that, we're selling our customer short. Absolutely. So before we dive into the budget, though, I want to talk on a, on a topic that applies to most of the people who would be delivering a budget to their customers. And I want to talk about the difference between an account manager and a VCIO. Um, I, th I think these, these titles are important. And, and I'm going to pick on these two. We use a bunch of them in this space. We use account manager, customer success manager, business development manager, VCIO, VCSO, whatever you want to call it. You have two different kinds of people um, there are two different kinds of relationships that are really happening. So to not bore everybody to death and dive into all of those, we're just going to pick on account manager and VCIO. But the reality is that one of these is a very internal focused on our MSP and our MSP's needs job. And the other is a very external focus on our customer and what they get in their job. So as we kind of step into it, um, you know, the account manager, in my mind, is an old school relationship mentality where it's all about my MSP and my what, what, what we need from my customer. It has my interest in mind, right? What's our account manager do? Have you bought all my products and services? Have you updated all of your, uh, your, your assets and kept them within the life cycle? Have you, are you happy with my support team? Is there anything looming out here that's gonna make me lose this business, right? This is a defensive protective position that says, you know, bought all the stuff that I tell you to buy, you do everything I recommend, you're not really likely to leave me, you're following my best practices, so you're not likely to sue me. Um, and if you're an account manager listening to this, I don't wanna insult what you do, it's an important job, but I will encourage you or challenge you to step out of the shoes that you've been in in this position and kind of overreach a little bit, right? Let's see what we can do to deepen that client relationship and provide them with a better experience. Because just making sure they're not mad at your tech isn't a good experience. Just making sure they bought a yeah. new computer, that doesn't improve their experience, right? So if you're an account manager and you feel like you have no career path at your MSP, there really is a next step. Even if it doesn't change your title or doesn't change your role, it should change your compensation. Yeah, and often, um, you know, when we, you know, titles are, Titles are titles, right? Um, you know, I've, I've always been um, a firm believer that the, the title doesn't make who you are. It's you are the person that makes who you are. And that comes down to the, um, the, the processes that you put in place. It comes down to um, being genuine. Yeah. Um, there's, there's just so many other things that, you know, you can do to help set yourself apart. You know, that title is just a, a it's just a name. It's a name on a card. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't care what we call it. I want to focus on yeah. the process. Right. Yeah, and, and I want, and I want the people that are filling these jobs to focus, not just on the job that they have today, but on the job that they want to have and the result they want to get for their customer at the end. So that's when we go kind of to the next title, right? This VCIO or VCSO, but I want to pick this apart because I think this title is one of the few 
where the name actually matters, the title actually matters. And, you know, you, if you say t titles don't matter, you've obviously never worked in banking because everybody has to be a vice president or they're, uh, you know, the, the world is going to end. But in the MSP space, right, we wear a lot of hats. But one of the hats should include at every MSP, this virtual chief information officer. And I don't like VC CIO. I think it should be F CIO, but I can see where that would be offensive to the CIOs in the space. <laughs> So we'll right. stick with VCIO, but this is really a fractional chief information officer, right? Virtual just makes it sound like he's inside a computer somewhere and doesn't really exist. But right. the fractional chief information officer is somebody who really has a C-level title in our customer's organization. And think about how that's different from the guy who just has to make sure you bought all my products and services, paid all your invoices, don't hate my tax, and aren't at risk of churn. That's a way different thing to be a member of leadership at my customer than to be protecting a, a, a check, an inbound revenue stream at right. my MSP. And in a lot of MSPs, especially if you're small in size, you're going to have to fill both of these roles. But you need to make sure that you're splitting your time and that you're getting some time spent at this upper level, more valuable thing. And everybody just runs around the, the industry saying, let's, you know, you need VCI, VCIO services. We don't spend enough time talking about what they are. And budgeting is a key piece of what separates account manager from VCIO. Because the account manager's idea of giving a budget is here's all the invoices you're gonna send me for the next year. And we'll get into the VCIO piece of it in a second. I saw you're gonna say something. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify too, you know, when I say, um, you know, the about the titles, um, you know, title is just a title. Um, I think a lot of times what I wanted to clarify is that a lot of times we get wrapped up into, oh, this is what I am versus really getting wrapped up and passionate about this is what I do, right? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times we just get, you know, a, a title, there's, it's like asking an MSP, what is an MSP, right? You, you're <laughs> going to get a thousand different you answers. You are. And uh, so when, when you um, truly deep down and in your heart and you've got that passion um, and it's, it's all for what you're doing for the client, that's, that's the most important thing that matters. Yep. And, and I think when we start to tear apart these two roles, right, we've got, we've got account manager and BCIO, they're both important. We have to protect that incoming revenue. The cheapest right. customer to sell is the one you already have. But we also need to take on this new school approach, this new mentality of what's in it for my customer. And how do I live at the level of that C-level executive, that leadership team member at my customer. And a big piece of that is taking budget to the next level. It's building what I call a total cost of ownership budget. And not enough people in our industry are talking about this today. Because if we're helping our customer budget for technology, and I was just at Chris Weiser's event in, in Tampa, I'm sorry, in Austin, where they said, uh, and I forget who was presenting, that said, um, budgets don't get cut, costs get cut. This was not me presenting. I did present on budget there. I had no idea this was coming. It just uh, softball. But, um, you know, it, it, it actually made so much sense. Once something gets encumbered into the budget, companies just pay for it year after year after year after year. When something is looked at just as a cost, it's likely to get looked at and figure out how to cut. So if we can help our customers budget for technology, we're less likely to have those service, products and services cut. And I think that's super Absolutely. important. And in, especially in tough financial time when, when companies are looking for where the savings are at. Right. So, so let's step in real quick and, and kind of take a look at what it looks like to build a budget for a customer. Because there's some, there's some easy low hanging fruit, right? There's the asset list. And this is yeah. what most of us have been doing for our customer for budgeting. Guilty at my MSP for almost a decade. Um, you know, these are your servers. These are your PCs. This, these are when they need to be replaced. Uh, here's my report out of that way overpriced platform that we bought that, that told me that color coded these for me the first time, right? But what we don't realize is there's a lot more technology in our customers building that we need to be account accounting for. I'm stunned to find out how many MSPs have two, three man shop. When I get, when I get my first look at their data, when they're onboarding into Lifecycle Insights and we're helping them build their first budget or helping them really do their first data cleanup, how many of them don't have anything but servers and workstations, laptops and virtual servers, things you can install an agent on, documented in their PSA or in their IT glue or in their Hudu or whatever they're using. And there is a whole slew of other stuff. This is probably only 60% of what their technology spend really is because right. they've also got firewalls and switches and wireless gear, printers, battery backups, monitors, 
conference room equipment, phone systems, IoT devices, industrial control devices. Some of those things may be around 10 or 20 years, but they're there and we need to know about them. Um, door access systems, camera systems, all of that stuff needs to be replaced at some point. It all has a life cycle. Yeah. And if you're liable for any, you name a compliance, any compliance, NIST, um, CIS, CMMC, HIPAA, PCI, every one of them starts with inventory your assets. Now, if I go to an MSP and tell me, where's your inventory? The first thing you're going to say is it's in my PSA. It's in my RMM. Right. And then we're going to go look and all those assets are going to be missing. So we've got a compliance problem that just feeds a budget problem when we don't have all these assets accounted for and documented. And the tough part is each of those asset types is going to have a varying lifespan. I always joke that nobody's thrown away a printer that didn't catch on fire yet. Um, right. where, where MSPs will argue with me whether 36 or 48 months is right for a laptop, right? Um, printer, I guarantee you, each one of those that's arguing with me has a 10 year old printer in their instance, in their monitors, in their installers, right? Yeah, let's look at displays. I mean, you know, the, if they're still square, there's a problem, but I'm sure you have some. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's that. And I mean, even <clears> if they're not just the changes in, in resolution and the sizes, you know, the cost of a uh, uh, larger monitor is going to 24, 27 inch, um, yeah. you know, you, you, those are things that you have to focus on. Um, because, you know, a lot of times, you know, you'll go through and, you know, client will say, let's replace all the workstations. There's no doing anything with monitors and, you know, and maybe early on, or, you know, when you first start doing this, it, maybe it does make sense that the, that they're looking, they're fine. Right. But, um, the next time around, you, you may need to change it up. And if you don't have that insight, you don't have that knowledge right away, then, um, you're just, you're behind the, um, you're behind the, behind the eight ball. Well, and one of the things we really focus on is replacement cost. And if you haven't right. accounted for monitors and then you go to replace somebody's PC that you told them it was going to be 900 bucks because you didn't want to overspend for them. You were being you know, conscious with their, with their cash and their spend. And then you go, oh, that person has a dual monitor set up. There goes your right. 900 bucks. You yeah. can't buy very much PC and stuck, stick two monitors on it for 900 bucks. So, exactly. you know, we need to be cognizant of all of the assets that are plugged in, all of the assets that exist. And sometimes that involves getting out of our comfort zone, going on site to the customer and walking through the environment and saying, what exists here that I can't detect with an agent, that I can't run a network scan for, that I can't see from my cushy chair um, and go do that, that time consuming thing that we really don't like to do and just go do a quarterly or semi-annual or annual walkthrough of your customer's office and make sure your documentation's right. Yeah, and you have to, because like, like again, going back to monitors, um, you know, things have changed as far as like what cables you need, what adapters you need. And um, if you're, if you don't have that documented now, you're going to slow down the sales process, throw it off track possibly because you're like, you know what, we're going to have to come out on site now because I don't have this, I don't have that. And uh, um, if, if that was done in the, in the beginning and you I'd like to lie to you and I'd like to lie to you and tell you nobody ever had to drive an hour each way at my office to go pick up a dongle to plug in a new monitor to a machine that didn't have the right output, but it may yeah. have happened a few times, right? So right. it's happened to all of us. It's a thing. Um, and it's just that the, these are the things that are easily avoidable if we do a little bit of proactive work and they really deliver value to our customer. How much value are you taking away from your customer when you bring them their new PC, you set it all, you get it all out of the box, you move them out of their desk and you go, I can't even plug this in, go back to work. Right. Let me hook your old one back up right? Now we've disturbed them for nothing. So when we talk about delivering value, the asset list is a great place to start. Don't forget that inventory matters and when you're talking compliance anyway. So this is stuff you're going to need to do for your customers as compliance becomes a reality. Um, the next piece that we really want to talk about when we look at budget is projects. Projects are one thing that can't always be seen real far into the future. Sometimes a new technology comes out and we're going to have to roll it out for a customer within a year or two of it even being invented. And we couldn't have planned for it five years in advance. It didn't exist then. Um, but we do kind of owe it to our customers to map out all of the projects that we could foresee as far into the future as we can. I always aim with, with my clients to give them at least three, maybe four or five years worth of projects stretched out on their, uh, on their budget. Um, if there may be a world in which they're going to say, I don't even know when to schedule that. It still doesn't hurt for you yeah. to have a section on your budget that says projects not scheduled and show them that as I, as I go forward and backward in my deck here, um, show them that there may be a project that you know there's a dollar value associated with 
They're not ready to commit to do it, but you need to put it out there. It addresses a risk that exists in their environment. It's going to be necessary at some point, and they need to know that that money's looming outside of what you've kind of budgeted for elsewhere. Yeah, and two, two quick things. Um, number one, out of sight, out of mind, right? If you don't have it on there, even if it's not a dollar amount or a date, it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's gone. Um, and it's not even thought about. Yeah, and everybody's selling us a product today that'll scan the network and show us where all the vulnerabilities are and that'll, or that'll let us take all those vulnerabilities and put them into a, into a red, yellow, green heat map that I can go show to my customer. Heck, we sell that at Lifecycle Insights. What good is that? If I show them all the red, yellow, green, they read it, they tuck it in a drawer and never look at it again. Right. Everything that has a risk has a cost of being remediated. And that's where projects come from. So and you, you might as well go through the remediation plan and cost it out and at least give your customer a ballpark of what it costs to fix everything or what it costs to fix nothing and continue on with the status quo. If we're really being transparent, if we're really operating with their best interest in mind, being that C-level executive in their company instead of the representative of my company, I'm showing them all the options. I'm being very transparent with what risk it, what risk really exists and what it costs to make that risk go away. Yeah. And if we don't have, if we're, if we're scrounging, if we're like, oh, okay, what can I throw on here? What, what could I do? Um, then we're not having the proper conversations with our clients. You know, we're not sitting down and meeting with them and uh, talking about their business, not their technology, but we need to talk about their business, where their challenges are, where the bottlenecks are. And I'm sure you got more of that coming up here. But, uh, but yeah, those, those are the things that you know, we overlook. We, sh we shouldn't be <clears throat> scrambling and, and wondering, gosh, I wonder what. Well, it's not, it's not what do I wonder, it's what do we wonder yeah. because we're a team together with the client. And, and I'm, not getting, I'm not going down the rabbit hole of what should be in a QBR today, but I'll say you know, 10 years ago, um, a company in, who's very big in this space said, said to us, all of us as an industry, you need to start doing quarterly business reviews because you need to justify your existence because you're solving 75% of your tickets remotely or 85% of your tickets remotely. Right. And we took that to heart. We said, I have to go justify my existence. We started going to our customers and going, look at how many spams I anti-spammed. Look at how many viruses I antivirus. Look at how many flux capacitors. Oh, wait, that's not really a thing. But that's what our customers hear. Right. And we start talking about those things. Yeah. And so, you know, we went and had that conversation with our customers that let me justify my existence. And they went, I just assumed you were doing all this anyway. Would you please go away? That was a waste of my time. And then we go, my customers don't want to do quarterly business reviews. I don't understand why they won't meet with me. Right. Because we're trying to justify our existence and they don't hate us yet. They haven't fired us. So we don't need to justify our existence yet. Right. So there's a there's a breakdown between what this industry told us when they were trying to sell us all these powerful tools to do remote monitoring and maintenance and, and run your business 85% remote and what our customer really needs from an expectations perspective to run their business. And, and that's, the, the, yeah, that's, the, that's the point I'm trying to make is that we just need to make a shift in our mindset. One of the, the big dangers is that because things can run so smoothly for what we do because of the level of automation that we have in place, um, we get into that mindset, of, man, isn't this great? Just, you know, think about the, where our margin is at with this client, because, you know, you know, we, we never have to go out there. We never have to do this. We never have to do that. And then we get complacent thinking about, Hey, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a good thing if there's uh, you know, from a, a problem perspective perspective, but it's not a good thing from relationship a driving. Yeah. Relationship, yeah. you know, driving that revenue, building the relationship and, and growing it. Um, and you get right back to, they come to solve for pain. They come to solve for risk and yet they stay because of strategy. And if we're missing the boat on strategy, if we're just fixing everything, there's, there's no reason for them to stay. When the next, when they have a, a strategic question, a strategic problem that we haven't already solved for, they're not going to come to us for it. They're going to go to Google for it. They're going to go right. to their chamber of commerce for it. They're going to go to their friends for it and go, how did you solve for this in your business? And they're going to be back and in the go same around boat. Us. They're going to be back in the same boat they were two, three, four, five years ago <clears> with how they felt with their previous MSP yep. of man, I just, I just don't know what they're doing. I don't feel comfortable, yeah. you know, just because I, I never really talked to them and we never hear from them. And it only gets worse from here because assets and projects are the easy ones. Then we get into vendor contracts. I guarantee you, less than one in ten MSPs on this call are delivering a list of vendors, their contracts, and their costs to their customers. And I'll guarantee you the one in 10 that's doing it, most of the, those are already Lifecycle Insights partners. 
nobody was doing this when we started doing it. And it breaks my brain that we think we can go to a customer and say, here's your total cost of technology ownership without including what they pay for their line of business applications, without including what they pay for the copier company or their mobile device management. All of these things roll right back into what it costs to, just to maintain the status quo in technology, not even to spend any more. And if I don't know that my customer pays for their biggest line of business application every year in April for the whole year and it costs them $40,000 and I come knocking on the door April 1st with a, with a $20,000 server quote, guess what? Now my customer has to decide how to split Solomon's baby. If yeah. I knew ahead of time that they had a big, you know, uh, Q2, I would have moved my server quote into Q1 or Q4 or Q3, whatever. I can move it. I can, I can shift it. I can, you know, uh, we, we can figure out ways to work around it if we know about it. But there's so much that happens at our clients that involves technology, but doesn't involve us, that we get complacent, we forget about it, and we just look at how many PCs they're replacing and everything else must be okay. Or I've heard from some MSPs that are like, well, you know, I, I really don't want to put that information in there because I feel as if um, maybe they're going to look at my costs because mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're seeing the reality of like, holy crap, I, I'm seeing all these costs out there and may, they might be looking at my cost and want as to- As a big one, yeah. 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 And, and that's likely, right? Because it is. But technology has yeah. never been more important than it is today. They can't run their business without it and your customers know that. Um, it is what it is. I mean, they're paying that expense every month. So just because- you know, it's, you might not put it on this report, doesn't mean that they're, they they're not going to think spending. about it, right? They write the check every month, they know how much you cost, right? right? We need to be transparent with them. But we also need to be out there sitting in front of them saying, you know, you've got all these other costs, and maybe we can save some money on this one over here. And maybe we can save some money on this one over here. A lot of MSPs don't even know that their client is buying monday.com or uh, some other like Jira or some, some project management software. They could be replaced by Microsoft Planner that is given away free in, in, uh, in most of your office subscriptions. Right. A lot of MSPs don't know that their clients got some crazy scheduling software and now their scheduling software baked into a, a fancy team subscription that bolts right on and just rocks and rolls. Um, a lot of MSPs don't think about, I could save my customers some money here and actually show my value and show them that I'm about more than just cashing their checks. And, and I could deliver more, more to my customer. But let's take it a step further. As we get more and more into compliance, we're gonna have to start helping our, our customers do vendor due diligence to avoid these man in the middle attacks or these, um, these uh, supply chain attacks that come from all these software applications that they have. Well, if we're doing vendor due diligence, we have to have a list of all their customers or all of their vendors anyway. Why not just get it on the budget? Or take it the other way, once we get it on the budget, now we can start having the vendor due diligence conversation, show where we can add some value and even charge them extra to help baby step them through the vendor due diligence process and make sure that their vendors are doing what they're supposed to do. And but, let's not forget that if we don't have this stuff documented, that we're, we, there's so many other things other than the, this component we were talking about that we're failing to um, uh, work with them on and protect them from uh, two-factor. You know, I mean, if they're using a whole list of these uh, LOBs and we didn't even know it and it's not documented, then we're, we've missed the boat on, on keeping them safe and secure with things like two-factor. So remote access, however your vendors have to get into troubleshoot their products, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a whole conversation right. to be had around each and every one of these. And there's a ton of them. There's more of them than I could even imagine or put on here, but you've got, you know, just the, the basic stuff that we do between managed services and BDR and, and 365. Then you've got line of business applications, probably a different one for every department at the organization, right? They have a sales department with a sales tool. They have a, a line of business app for finance probably something for whatever product or service they deliver. Um, they've got ISPs and VoIP and, and landline companies. They've got wireless and data plans. They've got, um, you know, service renewals on devices like Meraki's and switches and firewalls and all those kind of things um, on top of leasing and Haas agreements. Every customer that tells you they don't, they don't lease anything, walk over to their office and look at the copier. Hmm. It's almost guaranteed to be leased probably 80% of the time. Um, then they've got managed print copy, print and copy costs on top of that at a lot of these places. Um, the little things that go into the budget start to become the hardware replacement, the, the projects and the, the, those kind of things. Those become the, the smaller portion, really, when we start to look at what they spend every single month on all these other things.
you know, a client with 10, 10, eight or 10 locations, they're spending 8,000 or they're spending um, $8,000 a year, $9,000 a year on internet, right? On the little things. And this all starts to add up. So don't be so afraid of your cost. Your customer knows what you what you charge. I get it. I was the same way with my customers that were spending, you know, four and five figures a month in, in really big numbers. But uh, your customer knows that. They sign that check every single month. Um, you know, even when we run, run it through uh, um, Connect Booster, they, they know what they spend. So moving on to look at the budget forecast. Finally, right? The thing we came here to learn about. We're finally going to look at the one document we cared about. Um, you know, you can present this document so many different ways. In fact, I almost always present it two ways. I, I like to present a short-term budget that is really tactical and a long-term budget that's really strategic. And the difference between the two of those is a tactical budget is items that I always say, if you're going to have a strategic meeting with your customer, then ask yourself, could it have been an email, a phone call, or a trouble ticket? Because if it could have been handled by any of those three things, it is not truly strategic. It is tactical. It's a problem to solve. You solve it. It goes away. Strategic is your big long-term budget. It doesn't need detail. In 2025, I don't need to know, um, you know which workstations are being replaced to come up to $24,000. I just need to know 2025 is a big expensive year for this customer, and they need to be ready for it, right? 2021, the rest of this year, I might want to know what those workstations are that need to be replaced because odds are my customers got somebody got nagging them and, you know, a bill over in sales is bugging them because because his PC is too slow and it's keeping him from making enough cold calls during the day to, you know, to justify what he does, or whatever, you know, there's some squeaky wheel gets the grease on the near term tactical stuff. Um, and, and there's projects that are going to be related with near term tactical stuff. So I like a budget that's 12 months or maybe six quarters that's tactical, that lists out all the assets you're going to replace, that, that talks to the detail of what you're doing. And that's the budget you might also spit out in Excel and give to the finance person and go, hey, I built this little treasure for you. I don't know if you can import this into your finance software or copy it into the bigger spreadsheet that you use for your budgeting, but I know finance people like Excel. I thought I'd hook you up, right? We'll still deliver it in Word in our packet or on a, in a PowerPoint or whatever to our customer, but, um, but we want to show it to them a couple of different ways. And then the other thing, this is what we consider spreadsheet view. At the end of this call, we're going to give you a download for our full page, eight and a half by 11, you know, um, strategic budget. I, I, I did, I, I normally present it the other way. It's kind of a, kind of a short-term strategic budget, but it's, you know, fits nicely in a printed paper. I did this one strictly today because it, it fits nicely on PowerPoint, but if you're presenting remotely, PowerPoint view matters, right? So be, think about being able to spread this out and, uh, and use it in a fashion that is, uh, appropriate to how you're how you're delivering it that day, right? If you're if you're binding it in a booklet, long ways this way. If you're if you're showing it on a PowerPoint, make it landscape and and, and turn it around and, and make it uh, uh, something that they'll be able to use. Yes, we'll absolutely share this with you. Um, uh, we'll give you a sample of that uh, of that for full page uh, you know full page document. And if you give this, like you mentioned, Alex, if you give this budget to the finance person in that at that client's office, you are going to blow their mind. I mean, that is so far from what they've ever, ever expected or, you know, their, what their relationship is like in the past. And that is going to blow their mind. That is going to, you know, help them to understand that you're not just there about tech. You're there about business. We're here to help them run the technology side of their business. We're here to help them solve business problems with technology. And sometimes technology creates business problems, right? Look at this budget. This is a perfect right. example. I have $65,000 in stuff I should have already paid for. This customer has a debt snowball. They have yet to do this year another $51,000. We're almost at the end of the year. They've got to spend $51,000 more. So this customer has a $115,000 debt snowball. Then they're going to drop into three years of really low spend. And then they're going to spend another $55,000. So this customer's budget has more humps than a camel. It, it, it looks okay. like this, right? And that is very hard for most organizations to do anything with. So this is a customer where we really need to sit down and not just give them a budget, but talk about, does leasing help you? Does hardware as a service help you? Can I help introduce you to a grant writer who could help you, in, you know, get some money to, to flatten this out? Or do we keep some things a little longer this time and, you know, push some of these 2021 expenses into 22 and 23? And then do we, do we buy some of the 2025 expenses early and pay them for them in 2024? Because our goal is a nice flatline budget, right? Not always doable, but if we can decrease the percentage or the, you know, the, the, the difference between the top and the bottom budget, between the, the, you know, the high number and the low number, 
we make it easier for this customer. Because I guarantee you, if you don't have a talk with this guy, he's going to be mad at you this year, he or she. He's going to be mad at you this year. Okay with you this year. He's buying a boat this year. And then he's mad at you again this year, right? Because we didn't tell him what we should have known. Because you know damn well, you know what workstations in your environment just got deployed this year and need to be replaced in five years. You can plan for that. He can't. He or she, your customer cannot. And so that's why th there's a reason why this falls on us. And there's a reason why I want account managers to make the next step to get out of the, the looking out for the, for, the, for the MSP and do a with them, which is what's in it for my client, right? And, and go out to our client and help them understand this budget because it is hands down the number one document that we would lay on the table at my MSP and have somebody go, holy crap, I've needed this forever. Where was this? And I would have to apologize and go, I'm sorry, the software didn't exist for me to be able to build this. So I built it myself. And if this is, you know, more than likely uh, for many, maybe not so much for others, but if this is so uncharacteristic for what you've been doing in the past and you start spending time on this, you might feel like you might feel awkward. You might feel like, I, I feel like I'm spending too much time on this. I'm, I, you know, I'm used to solving uh, technical problems and, and doing this and doing that. Well, this is, you, you want to spend time on this. Um, you know, this isn't something that you just, you know, quickly throw together and, and hand it to them and say, oh, I did a budget for you. It does take a lot of um, thinking. It takes a lot of discussions with them to think strategically. Um, so that time that you're putting into it, that is tremendous, you know, as far as what differentiates you. It's huge. And, and it's going to be one of those things where the first one is the hardest for each yeah. customer, right? The first time you go to your customer, your budget's going to be incomplete. You don't have all their contracts and subscriptions. Right. You, haven't, you haven't planned for every project, but you know what? Even if I just give them servers and workstations the first time and explain to them the process we need to go through to fully document the budget and work with them and partner with them and act as a level of their, uh, as a member of their executive team to push this process through and make it happen. Now I've delivered all that value. And that's really what this is about. This is about delivering value to your customers so that when they see your $3,500 a month invoice, they go, yeah, but I like him. He just gave me a budget and told me that I need to worry about 2025. I don't even have to worry about this year. That money's already on the budget. It's taken care of, right? So, you know, this is about delivering value, but it's funny you mentioned the time that it takes to do it because we were going to do a demo of this budget process for everybody here today. Um, and so I logged into Lifecycle Insights and I was like, all right, let me do a demo of how to build a budget. And I did the two clicks it takes to build a budget and realized that's not much of a budget. That's not much of a demo. Um, so as we wrap up today, we're going to give you guys a, uh, a link to a sample budget. We're going to give you a link to a free trial of Lifecycle Insights. We literally generate this budget in two clicks. And if you want it to be a three-year strategic budget or a five-year tactical budget or the other way around, or you want it portrait or landscape, add an extra click. This is data that already exists in your PSA in many cases. You're gonna to have to come back and add contracts and subscriptions and those things back in. You're gonna to have to up your game on inventory, but a big chunk of this data and the stuff to get you started already exists. So it's a couple of clicks. A demo of this would just be like, oh, he's showing off, he's bragging in his platform. So, you know, this shouldn't be hard. It's data that already exists. And that's why we wanna kind of wrap this up today by giving everybody a couple of components that, and we'll wrap it up and we'll open up and have some, some discussion and some conversation if anybody would like to, to give us anything in the chat or, uh, or, or come on and talk to us. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we talked about popping in for 30 seconds and showing everybody what this looks like. The problem is there's a lot of components that go into this and they don't get created overnight, right? The first one's going to be work. The second one's going to be less work. The third one's going to be three clicks and you're going to go, holy crap, why wasn't I doing this the whole time? But I'd like to kind of end with giving everybody the understanding that it's okay to go to your customer and say, I know I'm in the technology business, but believe it or not, the technology to do this automated didn't even exist until a year ago. And they've now got it flushed out to a point where I've been watching this vendor and I'm comfortable signing on to them and taking this to my customers. And I'd like to expose you to it. Um, I know I'm in the technology space and you'd expect more than that from me, but believe it or not, with all the fancy tools I have, some of them aren't the easiest to operate. And some of them don't give me the best visibility into the data that's in them. And so now that I have it and now that I can do it, Mr. Customer, I'd like to open you up to that. I'd like to show this off for you. Um, and I'd like to give you this level of detail.
So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead to the last slide and I'll copy and paste these notes into the, or these, these links into the chat. Whoops, as I'm, as I'm flying back here to slides that don't even really exist. Um, I will grab these, these uh, links and get them in the chat for everybody. Um, and then uh, we can open it up and have a conversation yeah. about any pieces of this if anybody's looking for, for something specific. Yeah, if there's anybody there um, uh, that would like to, you know, you, you can throw it in chat, but if you want to come on um, video, just let me know. Just uh, send me a message. I'm more than happy to bring you on so we can, you know, ask the questions about this. Um, you know, this, we're all in this together. We all start, we all have to start somewhere. Um, and uh, it, it comes down to, you know, looking at these processes, streamlining it, making, trying to eliminate as much as the administrative work that's required to do this as possible, right? And, um, and that's where the Lifecycle Insights uh, software comes into play is because, you know, it, it pulls that together for you and makes it easy. Um, as you wanna grow and scale your business, uh, if you don't put in, uh, you know, a methodology and a process to, to make this is, uh, I guess, as painless as possible, then you are going to look at this as a daunting thing that you don't want to do. And when you don't want to do it, you won't do it. And you'll get into a point where then you have clients that have, uh, you know, they're, they're sitting with a budget like uh, Alex is talking about, where there's 54,000 um, already you know, past due. Um, and then you also have these expenses going forward. And, um, you know, nothing is worse than having to go to them and saying, um, you know what, you need to replace everything you have. Um, I, I must have been asleep at the wheel. Um, but yeah, yeah, all of a sudden, yeah, your stuff has to be replaced. And but you, but you uh, know, what? sometimes it's okay to just go to your customer and say, I'm sorry. And we're right. going to put a process in place to make sure we never end up here again. And that's yep. okay. You know, I, I know a lot of the folks on this call have heard my spiel before, but, you know, I got to this, to this company, we built this company because we identified a bunch of things that ConnectWise should have been doing for us. We felt like ConnectWise should have been doing, they should have been automated. They should have been easy and they weren't, we were doing them all by hand and the entire platform, all of Lifecycle Insights, there's nothing here that you can't do yourself by hand if you really want to. Do I think right. everybody wants to do that? No, not really. Um, you know, we can save you time. We, we believe it so much that we can, uh, that we can save you time that we'll even back it with a money back guarantee. We'll give you 30 days for free. If at the end of 30 days, we, we can't pay for our subscription, we'll extend you another 30 days. So, you know, we're one of the few platforms out there that instead of bragging about the fact that I can save you the cost of an engineer, or, uh, you know, I can make you so much money, you can buy a boat. I'm just going to tell you, I can buy you back some time and help you make money in the process. And if we can't, um, we'll put our money where our mouth is. Because too many MSPs have been, you know, are, are kind of experiencing this tool fatigue where every week somebody asks them to buy a new tool and they don't know where the money's going to come from to pay for it. And that time is such a, uh, a critical thing that you're talking about. You, you can't go to Amazon and order time. No. You know, it's, you know, we, we have to do the best we can to get as much out of the time we have as possible. Um, and again, when it comes to scale, um, we, I mean, why, why did we get it when we got into this business um, of moving from break fix to managed, why did we look for automation, right? Why did we put in our RMMs and PSAs and, um, you know, any other agent that's out there? Well, we did it so we could scale the business and get to a point where we're, we're focused on uh, continuous MRR and uh, you can't do it in a manual process as much as we are wired we is uh being an it industry we are wired to figure things out to find a way right and we just we just want to do it and sometimes you have to realize uh like when you're working on an issue you got to know when to throw in the towel right and that and that doesn't mean give up but that means saying don't continue going down the path you're going because it's not you know uh you know like the definition of insanity and you know you do the same thing expect different results so, so, you know, it goes back to when I ran an MSP, there was a sign over my desk that said, if you have to do it twice, automate it. And we really pushed our techs to go, you know, what if I have to install this piece of software to three machines today, one day we'll reload those three machines. One day the customer will hire more people. We'll have to do it again. Let's build a script. Let's get, let's get it automated. Right. Um, and then we sat around and did quarterly business reviews by hand. And it really annoyed me. It, it made me crazy. 
Um, it used to take me six or seven hours for my biggest customer, three or four hours for my smaller ones. Yeah. I've actually worked with an MSP who told me 10 to 12 hours is what he spent doing this by hand. Um, wow. it, it makes me sick in a business where we, we preach and preach and preach about automation and, uh, and, and finding a better way to do things. We do way too much by hand. And it always comes down to doing the things by hand that are the things that impact the relationship the most and can't afford to be dropped. And yet we take too long to do them so we don't get to them at all. And we go right back to that cheapest customer to grow the relationship with, to buy, to, you know, to, to get more out of, or even just to keep that MRR coming in the door. The cheapest customer is the one you already have. The acquisition cost is near zero. Um, if you go meet with them and have good conversations with them and, and build a relationship around real strategic thinking, not just around, you know, buy more products and services from me because it makes it helps me make my Maserati payment. Um, but about real strategic, like, hey, here's where your risk exists. How are you going to handle your risk? And um, I think it was Eric on our weekly call that said, I always present this as Mr. Customer, this is your risk. How are you going to handle it? And would you like my help? Right. And I think that's beautiful because at the end of the day, they own the risk. We couldn't possibly buy enough insurance to, uh, to insure all our customers. This right. is their risk. That's proof that this is their risk. And, uh, and we're just here to help them with it. So if we can help them with the strategy, it elevates us beyond that, uh, that wrench turning guy. And, you know, until I figured out some of this, the best thing I could figure out to get him to stop asking me to crawl under the desk to fix things was to wear a sport coat. Um, this really elevates you to the next level instead of just fake it till you make it type thing. Uh, and it really delivers value to your customers. So um, it, it's something we're super passionate about. I've talked about it on stage at, at seven figure MSP and now here, and you know, it's a, it's a message. It's a drum. We're going to keep on beating for a little while um, until some more people pick it up and, and run with it, because these are really things that your customers should see value. in. there's no excuse in 2021 or 2022 for us coming to our customers and going, uh, you know, I didn't see Windows 11 coming and there's a TPM thing and now you got to throw away all your equipment and, uh, and start over. Surprise. Yeah. No excuse. No excuse. And our clients are expecting us to um, have thought through those things. Right. And uh, but we need to the, we need to have those conversations together with them. And uh, because it does come it comes down to them making the final decision, making, um, you know, making the commitment um, to make that happen. And uh, so um, uh, I, I'm just looking at some names in here. I'm just like, man, I, I bet they would love to talk. And <laughs> they're, they're a quiet group today. They are. They're I wonder if they've quiet. all got us, got us unmuted in the background and, and just wait for the recording because they're listening to somebody smarter talk. I don't know. <laughs> You know, or, or they're all uh, sitting at an airport somewhere and they're stranded. And it happens. And I'm surprised you've got such a quiet place to have this conversation from. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, this is simple content. It's easy content. It's not something that we have a lot of value in taking a whole hour out of their day from. We can give them a few minutes back. I do want to call out the last thing there, though. Um, if you're an Everything MSP um, Facebook member, uh, you found this webinar through there. Um, there is a coupon code for $50 off your first three months. You still get your free trial. That's $50 off your first three paid months. Um, and That's if awesome. you need anything, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or lifecycleinsights.io. There's a big contact us button and you can grab us there. And I, I also want to just mention too that, you know, we, um, we're talking about a lot of things that like, well, if you don't, or if you're not doing it this way, then, um, then you must be doing it, you know, in a manual way and you've got this and you've got that. And it, 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 by no means are we saying, well, the, you, you suck, you know, I, I, for lack of better words, um, I, I, uh, you know, it, it, you know, we're all, we're all at some point in our business where as we look to improve it, um, we have to just realize and be brutally honest with ourselves selves that there are some things that just because we've been doing them that way, um, we just have to wake up and say, you know what, we need to make a change here. This yeah. is just not going to be the best thing going forward. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean you suck. You're, if you're on this call, you want to do better. You want to find a better way to, um, to work with your clients, to improve your sales, to build a relationship, to differentiate yourself. And um, so you are, you, you've taken that first step into saying, um, I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to, I'm going to move forward with this, but the key word is commitment, right? And consistency. Um, you know, you, you can do this once, but the client's going to want it to be consistent, you know, as yeah. they, they're going forward. 
And so and it needs to be part of your, you know, ingrained in you. It needs to be part of your, your standard package. And it needs to be something that you review with clients based on whatever your, your um, frequency level is for your strategic conversations. Um, you know, this is one of those things that it's easy to go out and do it once and put it together and then, and then come back and try and try and deal with it. Um, what we figured was that just like all um, automation, it's a little bit of an investment up front to make it easier down the road. I would challenge everybody who's listening to think about this and say, if I wanted to step back from my business and take, you know, weeks of weeks and weeks of vacation, um, could somebody else do this work in my business today? And in most cases, the answer is as the owner, I'm the only one who can do this. And right. the value of a tool to do it is simply that we make it a process that's repeatable, that's standardized, and that becomes delegatable. And, you know, it was at right around a million dollars in revenue that I realized that most MSPs can afford an account manager, not only afford one, but have them pay for themselves. So, uh, you know, it's, it's super, super valuable to think about maybe that bar uh, barrier to entry for hiring that person who's going to help you with account management and do those things so that you can step back and do the other more strategic things on your own business um, is a little lower especially if you ask that person to step out of that strictly account management contract renewals, you know, warranty renewals, you know, shipping PCs and procurement type role. Um, when you ask them to do just a little more and take it to the next level because they generate more revenue for you, they definitely, they more than pay for themselves. They make projects happen over and over and over and they can even feed your project team. So, you know, a little bit of, of work up front to set up a tool like ours uh, will really allow you to, uh, to step back and take your hands off of this piece of the business. And uh, I know that because we see uh, regularly now um, MSPs sending um, account managers or employees of the owner into our boot camps to learn how to do this stuff and, and, and deliver it uh, you know, with, without the owner being involved. Well, Alex, this has been um, uh, a great conversation. Um, I thank you to uh, those that shared some feedback um, about today's uh, content. We appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we are here for you. Um, that's what it's all about. And that's what I love best about our uh, channel is that, uh, you know, you, you know, you do see in some industries where, you know, you view other, um, you know, you, you view others as your competitor, right? And, you uh, uh, we all work together in this industry, finding uh, ways that we can help each other and just do better for the common good and across the board. But um, with that being said, we're, we are at the top of the hour and I want to respect everybody's time and uh, move forward. I don't have any, it doesn't look like any new, any new questions here. Some um, great positive feedback and no new questions. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. So uh, again, Alex, thank you for your time and um, everybody on the call. We greatly appreciate your time as well. Uh, you will be getting a, a email uh, that will be for um, a survey. We want to just get some feedback from you just so that we are, are delivering valuable content. Um, but we'll also be sending you a uh, link to the recording. So you can watch back through it again. Um, you know, you might be just in the middle of things and need to, to jot back to it or share it with people on your team or other MSPs that you work with. Um, you, again, just to, to help others, just, uh, you know, the, the stronger we can be as a community, um, the better. So uh, everybody have a great day and uh, we will talk to you guys again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank